Bodium is everyone's idea of the perfect bucket and spade castle, but for the man who built it, Sir Edward Dallingridge, Bodium was deadly serious. Veteran of the Hundred Years' War, he wanted not only to counter the threat of French invaders, but also to impress his fractious neighbours. Today, it survives as a romantic ruin. Good afternoon again everyone. It's Valentine's Day today. As you can see I'm joined by the very lovely Candice. Hello. Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. My little Day. love. So to celebrate we're here in East Sussex and we're right outside Bodium Castle. We're in the Castle Inn pub and you've got half a lemonade, I've got half an Orchard View cider. It's never too early to start. And <laughs> so we're going to have a look round Bodium Castle today, as I say it's just over there, it's owned by the National Trust and it's considered one of the most romantic castles, very lovely looking, uh, as you'll probably see from the photos and stuff. So we thought let's go there, we both wanted to go there for a long time and then we'll be off doing a few other things, we've, we've both booked a, a few days off work so yeah keep your eyes peeled for a few more videos but Let's say we're going to finish these and then we're going to get cracking and have a look around the castle. It looks really cool. So let's get exploring. It's a beautiful day, too. Yeah, it certainly is. There's a guided tour at one o'clock, so you have to have a guided tour, but it's for like 15 20 minutes and then you're free to roam around the castle and stuff at your own leisure, which is pretty cool. And there's a lot to see here. We're just approaching the castle now. It's there it is. And there's also if I can point to it there, there's a World War II pillbox. We'll definitely be having a look at that of course. If you love history like me, I reckon you'll like this video. Candice is beaming, she's so excited. Honestly, I thought she was gonna fly here. Here we are, we're just outside the castle now. This is great. Bodium Castle is a 14th century moated castle near Robertsbridge in East Sussex. It was built in 1385 by Sir Edward Dallingridge, a former knight of Edward III, with the permission of Richard II, ostensibly to defend the area against French invasion during the Hundred Years' War. Of quadrangular plan, Bodium Castle has no keep, having its various chambers built around the outer defensive walls and inner courts. Its corners and entrance are marked by towers and topped by crenellations. Its structure, details and situation in an artificial watery landscape indicate that display was an important aspect of the castle's design as well as defence. It was the home of the Dallingridge family and the centre of the manor of Bodium. Possession of Bodium Castle passed through several generations of Dallingridges until their line became extinct when the castle passed by marriage to the Lucknor family. During the Wars of the Roses, Sir Thomas Lucknor supported the House of Lancaster and when Richard III of the House of York became king in 1483, a force was dispatched to besiege Bodium Castle. It is unrecorded whether the siege went ahead, but it is thought that Bodium was surrendered without much resistance. The castle was confiscated, but returned to the Lucknors when Henry VII of the House of Lancaster became king in 1485. Descendants of the Lucknors owned the castle until at least the 16th century. By the start of the English Civil War in 1641, Bodium Castle was in the possession of Lord Thanet. He supported the Royalist cause and sold the castle to help pay fines levied against him by Parliament. The castle was subsequently dismantled and was left as a picturesque ruin until its purchase by John Fuller in 1829. 
Under his auspices, the castle was partially restored before being sold to George Cubitt, 1st Baron Ashcombe, and later to Lord Curzon, both of whom undertook further restoration work. The castle is protected as a Grade 1 listed building and scheduled monument. It has been owned by the National Trust since 1925, donated by Lord Curzon on his death and is open to the public. The following excerpt is from the license to crenellate allowing Edward Dallingridge to build a castle from the patent rolls of 1385 to 1389. Know that of our special grace we have granted and given license on behalf of ourselves and our heirs so far as in us lies to our beloved and faithful Edward Dallingridge Knight that he may strengthen with a wall of stone and lime and crenellate and may construct and make into a castle his manor house of Bodium near the sea in the county of Sussex for the defence of the adjacent country and the resistance to our enemies in witness of which etc the king at Westminster 20th of October so we've just had our tour it was about 15 20 minutes really really good little tour the tour guide she was really good really informative and we're just having a little look around ourselves now there is a school over there so they're making quite a bit of noise and one of the most fascinating things i thought was about the glass in some of the windows the tour guide was saying basically uh, sir edward dallingdridge who owns the castle or kind of built the castle and got permission to crenellate it which means make a manor house defensive basically the glass was seen as like treasure as wealth it was expensive stuff it was a rare material back then so whenever he went away he would actually have the glass taken out of the windows and brought with him so that his servants that were be left behind looking after the castle wouldn't take the glass out and sell it and make a small profit for themselves i thought that was fascinating Straight ahead, on the opposite south side of the central courtyard, is the screen's passage of the Great Hall. This passage divided the house between the service end, west right, and the principal lodgings, east left. From the screen's passage, the kitchen was reached through the central of three rebuilt stone arches into a passage flanked by storage rooms. In a typical arrangement, the outer arches led to a pantry for bread on the south and a buttery for drinks after Boutel on the north. Above them were lodgings. At the western end of the passage came the serving place lit by opposing windows. The servery hatch to the kitchen was spanned by a large beam that fitted into the sockets. The kitchen itself is clearly identified by a huge roasting hearth in the south wall. On the north side a second hearth is seen with bread or pastry ovens set within an inserted wall that may be original or slightly later. From the kitchen steps lead down into the southwestern turret to a pool probably fed by a spring. There is no evidence for a well and this supply of once fresh water was ideally positioned. The upper levels of this tower comprise fine accommodation suitable for a kitchen steward, a valued role, rising to a dovecot with nesting boxes. Beyond the screen's passage are the vault and external arch of the postern tower, the tradesman's entrance, once used for delivering goods via a drawbridge. This does, however, bear the arms of Nollies, which suggests it may have provided an alternative entrance. It also once had a portcullis. As one of only two entrances to the castle, 
the postern tower had to have strong defences in case the castle was attacked. We are currently standing underneath a set of murder holes. These elaborately carved gaps in the stone allowed the castle guards to throw down dangerous and unsavoury items on the attacking soldiers. There are more murder holes in the gatehouse. OK, it's 56 steps to climb up to the postern tower. Going up on my own because Kenzie doesn't like heights. So the guy did say look out for Mason's marks. At the time Masons were probably one of the few people that were actually privileged enough to be able to learn to read and write. Most of the population couldn't of course. Our times have changed. Hopefully you can see all these. Looks like a fireplace there. Let's go and have a look in here. Ah, I think this is probably the toilet. Nice view looking out there, you probably can't see it, but looking out to the moat, so this probably would have gone out into the moat. Okay, so next room in the tower. Like I say, it's not the original roof. Another fireplace. Of course, that was their only means of heat warmth and natural lighting as well so nowadays of course we'd have a load of radiators <laughs> that's why pretty much every room's got a fire in it must have been quite smoky though even with the chimneys so i think i don't know if we can see up here yeah the, the chimney goes right up there out to the top of the castle Ah, I've got another toilet here. This one's got a better view, I think. That we can see down into the the courtyard. Wow, <laughs> it's quite cosy in here, really. Another little view out to the moat. A loo with a view. <laughs> Lever at the top. Yeah. Wow, look at that domed roof. Wow. Outside, the view up here is amazing. I'll just show you. Look at this! Wow, you can see just down there the sun's right in my eyes, but 
down there, centre of the screen, that's where the World War II pillbox is. You can see the River Rother over there. Pretty sure that's it. And that'll flow all the way out to uh, to Rye Harbour. Me and Andy, Kent Survival Wild Camps there in the pillbox. You can just see how vast the moat is. That's where we were stood earlier. Sorry if I'm waffling on a little bit, it's just such an amazing building. And like I say, I've wanted to go here for years. Let's go and have a look around here. What I'll try and do is put some links to websites and like Wikipedia and stuff like that to give you some more information on the history of the castle. Should you choose to to further your your knowledge of it. It's amazing. So most houses over in the distance there. So apparently Sir Edward Dallingdridge's original manor house would have been where that tall conifer tree is there in the centre of the screen up on the hill. So he applied for permission to crenellate um, his manor house which would have been there and instead he, he was granted the permission to crenellate those bits there in the middle that's what you apply for crenellation for to your house and stuff don't know if you can still do it now that would be pretty cool <laughs> I'd ask me mum can we crenellate the house um, anyway so he got permission but instead of actually doing it to his manor house there he went ahead and built this entire structure so this is an original build uh, from scratch <laughs> so yeah he completely went against the wishes of of the crown and stuff and just went and built a whole castle instead there she is, she's down there bless her it's been a pleasure to be with her for a year and a bit now Oh, she's chatting to some old man. Stop chatting up old men, you. Where is she? <laughs> Somewhere down there. Oh, she's waving. She's spotted me. I've been spotted. Yeah. She's, she's very special to me. And I feel incredibly fortunate as well to find someone that enjoys the same things I do she's incredibly supportive of the channel and just everything I do couldn't ask for more really of course I've got Jenny, a friend to thank, she's a subscriber she kind of introduced Candice to the channel and as they say the rest is history so anyways I'm waffling on but I thought I wanted to include a, a little piece as it's as it's Valentine's Day so To the east of the screen's passage, the Great Hall was once entered through a timber screen, typically with a loft. Now roofless, the hall was used for the daily communal meals of the household. The servants sat at forms, backless benches, with tables set lengthways along the hall. The Dallingridges were provided with a stepped dais at the eastern end, so that in principle they sat facing the screen's passage, supervising the entire room, while expensive metalware was displayed behind them on the cupboards. But in practice, Many patrons retreated to parlours or great chambers to eat. The size of the kitchens here suggests they may have used the parlour for important receptions while retinues ate in the hall. Kind of the richer people like the Lord and his family would have stayed on this side and the other side, the castle over there, would have been for the servants. So this side of the castle here was less likely to be attacked by the French or whoever whereas of course that side over there more likely so pays to be wealthy back then 
There's the Poston Tower up there, so it was up there just a second ago. It was typical of medieval great houses that the high end of the hall led into the main private apartments. The dais stair led through 90 degrees to the parlour, the first of the withdrawing spaces of increasing privacy and richness from the great chamber to the patron's bedchambers. At Bodium they occupied the eastern range set over a basement with bedchamber suites at ground and first floors as can be seen by the fireplaces. The crenellations on the first floor chimney piece indicate that this was Sir Edward's apartment. Royal apartments came to be stacked separating king from queen but this was ceremonial. We might expect Edward and Elizabeth to have customarily shared a bedchamber. The occupants of this upper apartment were provided with a warmed room with a latrine. They also had a small private oratory and windows overlooking the altar within the adjacent double height chapel. those windows that's incredible okay so that's saying about that their own private chapel inside the castle so I'm guessing this was probably it then so yeah pause this if you want to read it the chapel's main entrance was from the courtyard up steps to a space paved in cream and green Flemish tiles and divided by a fine screen carved from chalk. Remains can be seen of the Ombry and Piscina for storing and washing communion vessels. Here we must ask how Dallingridge's identification with the Christian unicorn over the main gatehouse was developed. A crucifixion is amongst probable imagery, possibly in stained glass in a tripartite window repaired by Cubit flanked by the Dallingridges praying or perhaps this castle featured the militant St George or St Michael or St Margaret or the Virgin Mary with her promise of redemption this much is informed speculation There she is. You all right? Yeah. Oh, I think. Now. Really? No, I've got no tape. Oh, yeah, there's a door. Was the education tower for pre booked groups only? no access up there there is a staircase going up there oh wow Ooh. apologies for the out of focusing ok 
okay you can pause this little bit if you want and have a little read through it Bombay to Bodium the journey begins So that's a quote from Lord Curzon. It was such an impression that led me on the first occasion that I ever saw Bodium to fall an immediate victim to its charm and to desire that so rare a treasure should neither be lost to our country nor be desecrated by irreverent hands, Lord Curzon. So he was the man that actually left Bodium to the National Trust in his will. Okay, you can pause and read this bit if you want as well. Otherwise it'll be a very long video. Having to do some serious squats here. <laughs> Better be reading this. <laughs> Window in time. Homeward bound. A lot of reading here, you might want to get yourself a cup of tea. <laughs> Recall to life. The gatehouse is a fine design with severe massive walls and projecting machicolations featuring a crenellated parapet that could conceal archers. Beyond mere appearances it features several integrated lines of defence. Bodium was built during the early development of handheld cannons and the gatehouse contains gun loops from which to fire them. These features are often considered as only for show but the non-combatant may underestimate the danger of unexploded hail shot at close quarters. The gatehouse provided self-contained accommodation, probably for a constable who was responsible for security. It had three portcullis gates, the original outermost grill of ironclad oak remaining. And there were also two sets of timber gates 
hung on iron pin tools or hinge pins, one of which set was restored around 1830. The vault above features ring bosses or murder holes which are typical of military and court buildings of the period. Sir Edward and his guests would have arrived at Bodium across a water garden and over drawbridges. The medieval experience is lost, but from the polygonal bulwark at the northwest corner of the moat, we can still appreciate the impressive mass of this fortress residence. In the middle of the north arm of the moat is the octagon. It was originally reached across a bridge, the foundation surviving beneath the water. We now enter via a northern bridge, a route established by the early 18th century. On a rectangular island to the south of the octagon is the Barbican, the remains of a fortified outbuilding that protected the main gatehouse. This two-storey structure was occupied by a guard and had its own portcullis. On the way back to the castle car park, there is a brick pillbox, a relic of 20th century war built in the shadow of the medieval castle. After the fall of France in May 1940, Britain was suddenly and unexpectedly faced with the threat of a German invasion. General Sir Edmund Ironside, commander in chief of the home forces, decided on a policy of layered defence. Inland he created several lines of defence to slow down the German advance using natural features where possible. The Bodium pillbox was part of a defensive line along the River Rother, a natural tank barrier. It is built of brick and reinforced concrete and commands the bridge over the river 300 metres to the west. The pillbox comprises two chambers, the principal one for a six pounder Hotchkiss anti-tank gun and an annex for machine guns. It was manned by ten men from the Canadian Army and then by the Home Guard probably until 1944 when the threat of invasion had disappeared. Okay well as you can see we've left the castle now, we're just standing on the, the bank of the moat and I'm sure you'll agree this is an amazing setting, it is such a fabulous castle, it's so picturesque and it's beautiful, it looks good from every single angle, every time I walk around it I go that's another shot, I can't even decide what's going to be the thumbnail for the video because all of them, like every angle it just looks amazing so we had a really good tour, we had a really good walk round there on our own as well. We've had a pretty good day here yeah. for Valentine's Day, so yeah, I want to say a big thank you to Candice <laughs> for joining me. Happy Valentine's Day you, yeah. And uh, thank you at home for watching. So get in the comments, let us know what you think. And you'll see us again soon, so take care of yourselves, look after each other. See you soon. Bye. Bye.